Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to move to our last panel. So thank you so much for staying with us for this uh, last afternoon panel. My name is Marlene Larel. I will be chairing that panel that will be discussing Russian ideology and value on the offensive with five great papers, four on Russia and one that will give us a decentering view on Russia uh, from Central Asia and uh, our colleague uh, Eva from the National Democratic Institute for the um, uh, discussant. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our first uh, speaker, uh, uh, Antonina Berizovienko, from uh, currently our uh, uh, Petrak fellow, Petrak, uh, you, Petrak program, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Ukraine, Petrak Ukraine program uh, uh, at GW, discussing Putin cut of personality. Yeah. Antonina, the floor is yours for about eight minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Speaking of Russia today, it is impossible to speak about anything else but about the cult of the personality of Mr. Putin. Uh, he stays in power for approximately quarter century. And uh, nevertheless, in 2001, the journalists uh, picked the question, uh, putting it as a title in the article that was called, how likely is a Putin cult of personality? So there was something that people, that made people think that actually what we're looking for. Um, they, uh, and in the middle of 90s, it was the time when uh, a lot of publications uh, were uh, published, like, but mostly not in the uh, scholarly journals, but rather in uh, like uh, popular magazines about the cult of personality, because you know everybody uh, respects the great power, right? So nobody was so brave to talk openly about the phenomenon that actually in the previous century caused so many deaths and uh, suffering. So the uh, idealization of the Soviet system was replaced by the obsolete ideological uh, ideological omnivorousness of post-Soviet Putin's Russia on the one hand, and on the other hand, the cult of personality of the president of the Russian Federation actually became the uh, cornerstone of the political system of post-Yeltsin's uh, Russia. Uh, for RF, as well as for any empire which imminently gravitates towards uh, conquest, its subject is concluding the information space in a broad sense, and in a narrow sense, it is cultural forms, symbols, genre. The aggressive nature of the policy of the Russian Federation, the real and virtual military conflicts unleashed by it have created a situation that experts define today as a hybrid war in which a wide variety of linguistic and semiotic signs are used as a weapon. Let us remind that initially Putin appeared in the image of tight-lipped officer of the special services who, whose emotions uh, are inaccessible to external observation. Over time, the head of the Russian Federation turned into a close to everyone own media interlocutor for almost every viewer or listener who spends long time, sometimes up to six hours, uh, the so-called nationwide live broadcast from the TV studio where all strata of Russian society are uh, presented. Can we call Sarah? Yeah. <clears throat> no, it, it's not here, it's here. Uh, okay. With Berlusconi, we can see, you know, like, quite relaxed guy already. Mm. Uh, it is possible to single our, out several uh, thematic blocks formed in accordance with the target tasks sold by the information uh, production of the Putin era and which uh, represent integral narratives uh, dedicated to, first, create an image of strong Putin, if not the strongest person, person ever. Second, create an, an image of uh, strong Russia, and third, the creation of the image of alien, which structurally consists of image of two things, bad West and even worse Ukraine. 
These narratives often coexist within the communicative event, intervene, complement each other, and ultimately form a hypermyth of Ruski Mir. The central figure, the hero of which, is the Russian President Putin. The authors of the book Putin, Putiniana, and the issue of the post-Soviet personality cult, Cassidy and Johnson, define the formation of Putin's personality cult as the process of creating a tabula rasa in which every citizen, a communist or democrat, a journalist or politician, could see or draw uh, desired the qualities of a ruler that the previous leaders of Russia state lacked. Perhaps at the initial stage of uh, Putin's era, there was a tabula rasa option for Russian society within which Russians had the opportunity to add something to their own, uh, to Putin's image. The current situation, in, our, in my opinion, does not leave such an opportunity for anyone. And what uh, may seem to be the result of your vision is actually the result of a completely consistent, systematic informational influence on Russian society, the purpose of which is to build a cult of personality as the most effective model of state administration in modern Russia. In order to create the cult of Putin, the Russian state today uh, penetrates into all niches uh, of social consciousness uh, in the uh, in Russia and to the extent possible in other countries as well. It is known that all uh, types of information, including uh, for external consumption uh, in today's Russia, are uh, dosed and strictly controlled product. However, this does not negate the fact of its influence on public consciousness inside and outside Russia. of Russia. The massive spread of publications on Putin received even a definition there, uh, obsession with Putin. Uh, such products are not only authorized by the Russian Federation, but also largely imposed by, by it to, uh, uh, for consumption. A vivid illustration of this process is in Elizabeth Griffin photo gallery in Esquire magazine, the first picture of which we can see now on the screen. So this gallery was dedicated to 63rd uh, anniversary birth of Putin. Mm. This selection contains 30 photos of Putin with uh, very different subjects, as well as the highly anticipated, as for me, preamble uh, to them. And then the author, quoting Winston Churchill, uh, knows that Russia is an enigma, uh, shrouded in mystery and shrouded in secrecy. At the end of this uh, annotation, uh, Griffin emphasizes this man is truly a mystery. Uh, the equation follows from what has been said. Russia is a mystery. It's a common place uh, to know the well-known two chips definition, umom rasiyini panyak. Putin is a mystery, and therefore Putin is equal to mysterious Russia. So we have here, uh, I will try to go over those pictures. Here you see the president of Russia. This one's supposed to be Putin, at least it's announced like uh, in this way. So you have uh, presidents there, you have, you know, like the uh, landscape of red square, even 10 years before or 20 years before uh, he became the president himself. You see him with Obama, with President Kwan, we saw him. We see the whole range of his abilities to be a strong man in the physical sense. He loves animals and species love him back. You know, like the most severe animal, the white bear also, you know, is his subject. See, as well as the minimal one. He's a giving father's hand who feeds everyone, including animals. You see, this is relaxed Putin. These topless pictures probably are the most popular one, ones. And uh, he's able also to dance, to play piano. Uh, no joke. You can see, you can follow YouTube, and you will see several times when he was playing uh, in public. But the most, uh, I would say, surprising <laughs> picture is 
when he Putin appears in the image of a dentist. <laughs> Uh, as weird as it seems, it has very serious semiotic basis uh, uh, in this uh, picture. There is a, a serious, like semi a semiotic message here. You know, uh, Putin is from Saint Petersburg, as we all know, and uh, it was built by Peter the Great. And Peter the Great, among other uh, things he could manage, uh, loved to treat teeth of his subjects. So appearing in this image, Putin also makes himself look like Peter the Great. Uh, and in other words, he can use that semiotic potential that lies deep inside in this image. And if somebody does not know this idea about the Peter the Great, the dentist, so like the Russian people, know it for sure. Uh, for building of the image of the great Putin, everything that has at least some phenomenal, phenomenal, we go, oh, yeah, this is, uh, we go to another important thing and uh, we have more, but we can follow up in a Q&A uh, session. Uh, we have uh, here the uh, monument that was built in Moscow. And this is the monument for uh, Peter uh, the Great. Uh, the monument, uh, the opening of a monument of Prince Volodymyr in Moscow turns into an act of de uh, deepening the imposition of a paternalistic model, the center of which is Volodymyr. And uh, it does not matter which one, Volodymyr the, uh, the Great or Volodymyr uh, Putin. Uh, in the paradigm of methodized, pop, uh, methodized method, mythologized, I'm sorry, uh, public consciousness, reincarnation, resurrection appears not as an imaginary entity, but as a part of an actual political doctrine. And these two images merge into one. And as you can see, we, hear, we have here golden letters. Uh, Knyaz Vladimir, here you have the round and the arrow. So if somebody would miss this message, so this picture you can find on the uh, side of the president of Russian Federation. And uh, to close up, uh, I will show you the, uh, uh, I want to show you the scheme of the traditional model of the cult of personality that is, that presents us the mimesis that goes from social groups towards the dictator. And Putin and his regime established another one, actually it's their innovation and we have to admit it. Uh, along with that traditional one, they made another one when the dictator himself tries, you know, to enter uh, through the mimesis every single age or social group. Therefore, we have those rates of Putin that we thought that they are falsified in the beginning. But actually, now we can understand that actually they were not because uh, it was built, like it, it was kind of double because this uh, influence. And Putin, he doesn't, uh, how to say, uh, he showed himself not like a lazy man because he's uh, flying with cranes, you know, he's, uh, he's everywhere. He covers all elements of nature. And uh, the actual formation of the image of the cult follows the pattern of uh, uh, superimposition and combination of the images of Father, God, Tsar, and Putin. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Antonina. And I would like to give the floor to Ivan Fomin from the Center for European Policy Analysis here, SIPA, in uh, Washington, D.C., discussing Putin's ideology of traditional values in action. I will start talking. Oh, no.
Thank you. All right, yes. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, Putin's ideology. Uh, and uh, I think most experts agree that Putin does have an ideology, at least within the like, an, not capital I, but with a small I, in a sense that there is some set of more or less stable set of ideas to which uh, he tends to refer uh, when he um, uh, legitimizes his policies, his decisions, uh, and uh, his own authority. Uh, uh, however, there is a difference between having an ideology and actually relying on ideology and using it actively. And I think uh, this is some this is an important question in today's context because in order to wage a war, you kind of need an ideology, and an ideology can be kind of useful in this context. And so, in many respects, I think this uh, period of time is a big test for this Putinist ideology. Uh, and in my analysis, I try to take a closer look at how does Putin actually uses these more or less stable set of, set of ideas, uh, adapting them to different uh, contexts and to different um, to different goals. Uh, just a small example of this emergent trend of ideology become more prominent or, or at least more uh, visible and recognized even officially in Russia is this adopt, adoption of the of a decree uh, that fixed this set of uh, traditional values. Actually, this, this list itself is not that new. Uh, a slightly different version of a similar list appeared in the strategy of national uh, security of Russia in 2015. Uh, it's just a, another version of the same list. So this is some this is kind of the declared. Uh, you can see the, the declared the ideology of Putin. Uh, but another piece of context I think uh, is should, we should mention here is. This is the graph of Putin's approval uh, based on the value center of polls. And we see this decline in September, in October, September. And actually, this decline is associated with uh, the military mobilization, with the call up that was taking place at that moment. Uh, and we can see this, uh, this kind of decline in different questions, not only Putin's approval rating, but the support of the, uh, of the special military operation and so on. Uh, so, uh, I think this, this was one of the biggest tests for Putin's ideology, uh, or at least overall capacity to mobilize uh, and the, uh, his ideology as one of the elements of this toolkit uh, that can be used to mobilize uh, So with this in mind, I tried to uh, let some data uh, that would uh, allow us to kind of to triangulate, uh, to provide us different perspectives perspectives of how Putin used his ideology in different contexts. And in particular, in the context that uh, required some degree of mobilization. And this is a tricky task because actually Putin's regime what was used to be based not on uh, mobilization, but on a passivity mostly. So uh, this, is, this is not something natural for the regime. It's not, what, it's not something, uh, something the ideology actually probably fit for. Uh, so uh, the data I uh, I collected uh, is the following. It is the uh, that uh, at least I started with. This is the first piece. Second piece is this uh, uh, teaching guidelines for this course of uh, conversations about about important things uh, that are now introduced in Russian schools. This kind of this patriotic upbringing uh, that is introduced it was introduced last September. And also, I uh, collected eight other texts that uh, uh, that were produced by Putin in different contexts during his last presidential term. Uh, this is his presidential campaign rally, uh, presidential campaign rally speeches, his inauguration speech, uh, his address uh, when when there was this protests against the uh, retirement uh, age hike in Russia uh, uh, about COVID. Uh, about about special military operation, about the annexation of the Ukrainian territories, uh, and uh, about the mobilization. Uh, and uh, this list is basically actually follows the list of Levada Center's polls about what were the ma main events the Russians remembered from each year. Uh, so then I tried to split these texts into kind of this typical 
context. So uh, first we have this kind of declared list of values. This is kind of this part. Then we have this explicit indoctrination discourse. So this is when Putin's regime says that uh, it performs some form of indoctrination. This is how, how this is represented. Then there are contexts of acclamation. So basically these are situations when the regime produces some, uh, some argument, but actually the only supposed reaction is just cheering for it. So it's kind of this, uh, uh, these speeches and texts that, uh, that are supposed to uh, be just approved uh, and they don't call for any actions. And then there is some uh, three texts uh, that, uh, that calls for some form of, of mobilization. As I said, it's not something typical for Putin's regime. So I really had to push here. So I put the uh, retirement, the retirement age height uh, speech there and the and COVID speech there because those are the situations where the regime kind of tried to people actually either to accept something, uh, to endure something or to uh, to do something like that, like to get a vaccine, for example. And then there is this recent uh, military mobilization speech. So, uh, yeah. I'll, how much time do we have? I yeah. Okay. I, was, I will just go to to, to conclusions then. I, I have all, all kinds of graphs to support my, my conclusions, but don't, don't worry. Uh, 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 don't worry because if you have questions, I will show them that later. So basically, what uh, we can see in a nutshell here is that. Uh, what we see in how Putin used to handle the situations of mobilization was not based on this uh, list of kind of re references to patriotism or history or uh, humanism or whatever. All the previous situations of mobilization were based on claims about some welfare or well-being of people. So this was always the core of argumentation. All the rest were kind of just a side dish for this. Uh, so references to history were present, references to kind of unity and cause for solidarity were there, uh, but they they were they don't appear always, and they are not the most prominent elements in those in those speeches. And in this respect, the speech about military mobilization is actually something completely different because there this element of welfare is much less visible. So uh, so we see that. Actually, Putin tries to use the tools that were used for acclamation for mobilization, and uh, they, they don't work that well. Uh, so uh, I think, in a nutshell, this is this is uh, how we can uh, describe this limitation of Putin's ideology. So we, we can observe it through through time, we can see it in different speeches, but uh, actually, uh, it, it's never been tested in this capacity of actually mobilizing people. Uh, and uh, and before when Putin had to mobilize people, he doesn't use uh, that that much. He relied on some other tools. Uh, we, we can actually also also see that the list of uh, values that are promoted in schools uh, are not uh, it's not similar to that long list from the uh, from the decree. It is also a very limited list. It's a list that includes just uh, basically it is just another history lesson. And this is the this is what happened with the conversation about important things. And actually, this is also happening with the uh, with this course for the they, they, uh, they are now designing for universities that is supposed to be called uh, like fundamentals of Russian stateness. It also kind of got reduced to just history lessons. So basically, we, have, we can see this uh, this actually crisis of Putin's ideology. So or at least some critical transformation. Maybe it will go through it. Maybe it, it will manage to adapt. Uh, but for now, we can see that both in this indoctrination domain and mobilization domain, uh, there is some struggle in terms of developing a set of framework, uh, kind of a framework that is more than just uh, official narratives about history and uh, some actual ideas that can motivate people beyond, beyond some promises of well-being and prosperity and uh, welfare. Uh, yeah, thank you. I will show the numbers later if you want. Thank you so much. And now giving the floor to another Ivan, Ivan Gray here from George Washington University discussing the grassroots of Putin's ideology, civil origin of an uncivil regime.
did that's the work okay so a disclaimer this was the result of a three years field work so eight minutes is cool that's you know, now i can continue so um one of the major questions uh that all of us have how does this ideology work how it happens that uh, people can uh, believe in uh, ideas that are seemingly not connected to each other. So my argument and my proposition is to go to the level of uh, discursive practices. So discursive practices are those uh, common sense uh, meanings of words and terms uh, that we do not question. So for instance, we say democracy, we think freedom, we say uh, foreign agent, uh, we think spy. Uh, you ask anyone in Kentucky and uh, what was the Kentucky's history and it will be that we were part of Confederacy while they were not, right? So there's something established and set and not questionable. So if we go to those levels and uh, analyze some of those discourses practices, they will help to explain how particular messages are delivered and not considered to be just insanity. Um, so uh, I will specifically look at, uh, and basically that's my major argument, is that Putin's regime uh, and his ideology in many ways successful because of the corruption of grassroots trends that were there before he came to power. So uh, in this presentation, I will try to address three illiberal civil organizations that emerged after the collapse of the USSR, engaged uh, current elites in their networks uh, long before they became the elites, uh, and uh, produced and reproduced uh, three discursive practices. So first of, well, first of all, state as a physical entity. So uh, speaking about this uh, practice, um, in, in my interviews with the participant of, uh, participants of those liberal organizations, I realized that these people disassociate state power as the last and государство. So государство does not have an institution. It's a kind of a historical, metaphysical, uh, entity, it's really close to Heideggerian idea of authentic being. So this is kind of a, an ecosystem where the nation reproduces itself, right? So it has uh, barely anything to do with uh, uh, institutions uh, or anything else that we usually call государство. And basically there is государство and in the власть is somewhere in the middle. So it can be hated, but государство cannot be hated. Because if you hate государство, it's a suicide, it's a way to suicide, right? Uh, and this specific phrase, I'll address it a bit later, uh, that's what uh, Vladimir Yakunin told me in an interview in 2018, who is now heading the still the largest uh, former uh, NGO, now a gongo, uh, the uh, foundation of uh, St. Andrew the First Goal. Um, another important part of that is right wing post colonialism. Now we hear all the time Putin is referring to anti colonial discourse, colonialism, blah, blah, blah. So uh, basically, this discourse exists for like 40, 50 years already. It started in the Soviet Union with the Writers' Union, with the Village Prose uh, writers and Russian nationalists in the Soviet establishment. Their idea was plain and simple. So the Bolsheviks came to the Russian land with this uh, crazy Hegelian ideas of socialism and occupied us culturally, right? So how can we release ourselves and finally come back to our own centralized independent state? They never speak about the nation as a freedom and democracy. For well, them, freedom is to come back to the Russian centralized state. So uh, it was pronounced uh, in literature uh, for many times, and uh, basically Alexander Dugin made the entire career on, that, on this, right? So he took this Heideggerian sword and started to fight uh, the leftist Western ideas with rightist left, uh, Western ideas. So uh, the last part is pan-Slavic essentialism with the application of cultural constructivism. Sorry, did not come up with a good term for this. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the whole idea is that starting from the 19th century, and arguably that's at least how deep I can uh, find it, would be work right in Europe um, uh, by Danileski. We see, we see this distinction that uh, we all believe in uh, blood, in soil, and uh, kind of a common Slavic hood. Uh, uh, the belly, we have the same belly button. But when other Slavs are a political problem, we immediately find some kind of a cultural distinguishing feature that helps us to keep them out from our imagination or community. Usually these are the Poles. Fooled by the Westerners, they became Catholics, so traditionally this discourse was about the Poles. So now, as is evident, uh, this discourse is about Ukrainians who were fooled by the West as well, in the very same manner, right? And this discourse, once again, it's existence uh, 19th century, and it's kind of a common discursive practice and uh, the trick. So you can, be, you can claim that someone is through Russian, so we have the same kind of blood connection, but it does not work as soon as this uh, group becomes uh, politically inconvenient. Um, 
So about uh, the history. So all goes back to the Writers' Union, uh, who were the bridge uh, between the Russian Nationalist Soviet establishment and the post-Soviet uh, movements of uh, Russian nationalists. So I mentioned the Russian Party and the book by Nikolai Mitrokhin. Uh, so still the the Bible of uh, Russian right-wing uh, ideas uh, in the Soviet Union. So uh, in my research, uh, I particularly look at uh, the Writers' Union and uh, three of its representatives, uh, Valery Ganichev, Valentin Rasputin, Vladimir Salolkin, uh, and Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was kind of a not in their political team, but was really important for promotion of Russian nationalism as well. So the key player there was Igor Stroev, the uh, chairman of the Federal Council, the third most important person uh, in Russia in, uh, since 1996, who uh, was uh, I took an interview with him and he said that he was kind of uh, stuck with the ideas of Russian nationalism uh, since 1967 uh, when he was allowed to read uh, the prohibited literature. So that was his ideology. He was in the Gorbachev Politburo, but he still believed in this Russian cause. When the Soviet Union collapsed, he helped to arrange and organize uh, all of them and gave them uh, political cover and made Ariol, his native region, the land for experiments. So. Um, in 1985, uh, the Writers' Union arranged the celebration of uh, uh, the day of uh, Kirill Methodius, and uh, I will not delve in details here. 1985, the flag of uh, the brotherhood between the Bulgarians and Russians, pan Slavic uh, celebration, uh, total anti Soviet. Uh, and imagine if you want to have an event and you have a separate collection in the Mormons archive dedicated to this event. So that is still considered important in their uh, ideology and local identity. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, they have this uh, pan-Slavic agenda. Uh, but the same year, uh, the Writers' Union uh, of uh, Russia meets with the Writers' Union of uh, Bulgaria. And they have uh, a debate because the Russians, the, the, the Russians want to discuss orthodoxy, conservatism, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, the Bulgarians wanted to, dis to discuss Brecht, a Marxist playwright. As the result, read the Semenem's diary, who writes, representatives of the Orthodox Slavic nation Bulgarians looked as they were born further to the southeast. They were the Turks, not true Bulgarians, right? So until they have the political debate, they were the brothers. Once you have kind of a, a problem, imaginally Bulgarians are actually the Turks. Uh, so uh, similarly to so the start of right post-colonialism, just a quote from the uh, from the letter to um, uh, of the 74, the letter by uh, the uh, right wing uh, of uh, the Rights Union. Perestroika unleashed social destabilization, and Gorbachev's successors of outright racism have moved to the forefront of uh, this ideological reform. There was a massive persecution of the indigenous population of the country, the Russians, uh, which is essentially outlawed uh, uh, by that mythical rule of law, and that it seems that soon there will be no place Russians at all. And then they go on into the um, uh, discourse of uh, right post-colonialism, saying that basically our struggle against the Soviet state is a, is a post-colonial struggle against this uh, uh, cultural occupation. Uh, state is a metaphysical entity. You can read Anna, read Anna Rosavalova's book, uh, 800 pages, almost all dedicated to, dedicated to that and how the right-wing writers uh, developed this idea. Um, then, how much time do I have? Two? Okay. Uh, uh, I'll skip. Uh, so now you'll have to trust me. <laughs> there were other movements that, <laughs> that promoted the same ideas. Uh, some quote, quotes, just trust me that they fit. Uh, <laughs> conducted municipal reforms. But what I just want to point here is that there was another movement, the Russian Central Movement, that was kind of operating on the same ideas. And it engaged. Uh, Sergei Sabianin, Sergei Glazev, Vyacheslav Volodin, Nikita Mikhalkov, Kirill Kundyayev, Igor Stroyev, Evgeny Savchenko, uh, Evgeny Leonov, the actor, uh, Valery Ganichev, and they were contributing to their journals, participating in their events and promoting the very same agenda, but uh, kind of uh, as a fruitful development of the grassroots. So um, an interesting point is that um, there was this foundation of Santander, the first cult, uh, founded by three intellectuals uh, with the goal so, uh, to edify the elites, uh, uh, which they basically successfully did, and uh, the values were the same, just trust me here. <laughs> uh, and you see that Shaiku was also a part of uh, a part of this game. Uh, they just uh, gave those orders since uh, 1993, and the idea was kind of to put them in the same line, the current elites and all the elites starting from Peter the Great. So it worked uh, quite well, because by before 96, they, you see, just uh, 
uh, inaugurated uh, the already dead uh, prominent people, and uh, by uh, in the next four years, uh, governors uh, uh, were awarded to uh, so Alexander Lukashenko, Radovan Karadzic, Yuri Lushkov, uh, Igor Radionov, Minister of Defense back then, uh, Chairman of Gazprom, Sergei Shoigu. They were all kind of in the same group, sitting with the same conservative writers who founded this, talking about the same things. And um, in uh, uh, Yukunia now interview told us that in 1998, uh, the founder of St. Andrews Foundation came to him to fundraise. And back then he was kind of a mid-level official in St. Petersburg. And uh, Yukunia said one simple thing. We made money, we made careers, we, we, we lacked ideas. So then this guy comes and tells us that there was a whole world, right, that we can discover. And he got engaged in this uh, thing. So uh, in the first Putin's election, uh, the founder, uh, Melnik becomes Putin's envoy at the elections. And uh, we hear that uh, Putin pronounces the very same words that uh, uh, Melnik was saying since 1992 when they founded this thing. Uh, and in 2018, when I interviewed Yukunin, I heard the very same things about those three uh, discursive practices. Uh, he laughed at me when I said that uh, civil society shall resist the state, because that's an absurd statement. Uh, then uh, uh, he said the Poles can be a part of our world, because he was a, a good friend of a democracy, apparently. Uh, because they share de facto the same values, and he considered two to a candy. So you know we have this wrap. If we unwrap everything, we're the same, right? So uh, and then he said that orthodoxy is a culture that assures our independence, independence from Western values, right? So uh, this is kind of a pattern. Uh, all of these three um, discursive practices are pronounced now in the uh, in Putin's discourse, but I believe that uh, I don't have time anymore and. Uh, and continue later. Wish you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm making the other stage. I'm sorry. <laughs> and we now give the floor to Azama Jinizbay from Pizer College, uh, bringing us uh, a little bit further, leaving Russia to look at uh, uh, Russian support for uh, making sense of Russian support for war against Ukraine, a Central Asian perspective. All right, first of all, thank you everyone so much for uh, the stamina that you have, right, to, uh, to be here for this light panel. Very happy to be here. And um, yeah. A quick disclaimer, right? So, uh, what I'm about to share might sound somewhat Russophobic. <coughs> I'm probably the least Russophobic Kazakh you will meet. I'm probably the most Russified Kazakh, right? Um, I am a Russian <laughs> speaker. I grew up speaking Russian. Most of my friends growing up were Russian. I spent most of my adult life in the US and with my grown children, I spent an enormous amount of effort making sure they retain Russian because that's a language of my family, the language actually of my parents. And all this to say, uh, not a Russophobic. Uh, I think for this particular room, no one will be surprised. But just entertain yourself for a second, right? So the idea that a distinct Ukrainian people with their own non-Russian language existed since at least the 19th, 19th century is a recent fabrication. Um, and this beauty about Kazakhstan, Right, so the territory it has today, apportioned by communist autocracy, wherever the nomadic herds passed once a year became public. Right, this sounds like straight out of Russian TV in 2022, right? Of course, this is why the great Alexander Solzhenitsyn himself, right, the Nobel uh, Prize winner. Uh, and, you know, for me as an ethnic Kazakh, the idea that someone can be a ferocious opponent of the Kremlin, of the ruling regime in Russia, and be this imperialist is terrifying, right? It's um, perhaps silly, right? Maybe a little bit too human, but it's just, you, you would think, you would hope, certainly as someone with, you know, my entire family still lives in Kazakhstan, right? That the, you know, the Russia's best and brightest would be a little bit different, right, in that respect, but that's just not necessarily the case, right? I think that, again, for this room, no one would be surprised by this quote from Putin, 
right, about the, the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. But the truth is, and I think most of us who lived in former Soviet Union or studied it closely, right, a lot of folks view collapse of the Soviet Union as a terrible tragedy. Right, right? The, you know, that idea that we lost this tremendous country. And honestly, revanchism is good politics in Russia today, right? That's just the honest truth. And, you know, to say that Putin is entirely to blame for the horribleness that is happening now, right? For the sort of xenophobia, anti-Ukrainian sentiment, all that, it's, it's a bit like to say that, oh, you know, racism and sexism and xenophobia in America were invented by Trump, right? That's just not, doesn't really compute, right? Um, again, you all have seen the Rivada polls about support for the war. Support for the war has been remarkably stable, right? And depressingly high. For a long time, the latest data that they have on the Russian language version of the website goes to January. The English version didn't have January, so that's why you're looking at the Russian version. Um, of course, these results have come under a lot of attack, right? A lot of criticism from uh, actually Russian opposition folks, right? They're saying, look, the posters are just all these numbers are, you know. Kremlin dictated, they cannot be trusted. There is well, look at the response rate, look at the preference falsification issues. And really, they are attacks against the integrity of the pollsters. I mean, Levada obviously has been declared a foreign agent back in 2016. So I think it's one of the more serious organizations. And the head of the Levada Center, very prominently on their website, has posted kind of a methodological piece saying, wait a second, don't dismiss our work quite so easily. Actually, the response rates have been remarkably stable for quite a few years, right? There is not a dramatic drop that you're implying that we're experiencing right now. Also, we don't really have strong reason to fear that the preference, also, you know, the, the people are trying to give desirable answers any more now than they have before. Uh, interesting, uh, obviously, a previous presenter showed the same graph. A colleague at Occidental College actually helpfully added the little red lines here showing how uh, wonderful and invigorating for Putin's approval the attacks against Ukraine have been, right? And again, so if you are going to insist that Polls are useless, surveys are useless about support for the war because who could say, you know, I'm against the war if, you know, I could go to jail for that. These are approval ratings, right? There's not that sense of clear danger the same. And again, I mean, you have to be really willing to ignore this pattern to not see it. And, um, I think, honestly, the idea as a Central Asian, and you know, I, I challenge you to find any Central Asian who would not recognize this, right? As a Central Asian, as someone from a place that used to be colonized by Moscow, um, the idea that Russian folks genuinely see, saw themselves, saw themselves, see themselves as having brought development, civilization, industry, culture, science, modernity itself to the republics. It's very, it's widespread. It's not really controversial. Anything funny about this picture? You guys see who is the only person wearing a suit, not some ethnic uh, outfit, yeah. right? Uh, it's, it, it's, it's a 1972, if you're curious. I just have a poster, right? Um, this, so this stuff is, it's been there for a long time. Um, these are screenshots from a, an amazing little propaganda video from 2014. Uh, right? If you, again, have the taste for it, Google it on YouTube. It's right there, it has English subtitles. In the interest of time, I'm not going to show it here. But uh, the truth is, 
this a this is a situation right now i think where support is there for the war it might be political suicide for anyone aspiring to power in russia to to, to talk about this but the truth is support is there imperial revanchism is an effective political strategy right and the idea of Russia as this benevolent actor that brings good things and modernity to its lesser, always lesser neighbor, Stashi Brad, right? The big brother. It's not a new idea. The idea of Moscow somehow, of course, being the place that needs to be consulted before its neighbor, before its you know, former colonies can do anything, is not new. And um, any attempt to do something different um from what moscow desires is seen as a result of manipulation by washington right state department here or you know some other nefarious sort of great power right and um i remember six years ago when kazakhstan started talking about switching written kazakh uh from cyrillic to latin alphabet in russia it was likened to being stabbed in the back right and again that's about as a a small perhaps a change right as one can imagine but again it's seen as sort of result of this manipulation but i as a central asian i just have a hard time with folks saying oh it's all putin putin created this putinism monster we are victims right so we are in this repressive system i think putin used existing undercurrents in russian society to strengthen his power to strengthen his approval ratings uh you know there's been a, for those who follow this right there's been a lot of controversy about uh, Navalny for many years refusing to say explicitly right Crimea is Ukraine in his most recent statement he talks about 91 borders so that's important but I think no one again with political aspirations in Russia can afford to be as anti-imperialist as perhaps those of us from the former colonies would like to see, right? Um, and honestly, to me, the idea of Putin's war, Putin's war, right? It actually is a beautiful device rhetorically because it conceals the imperial roots of the aggression. And um, the, yeah, the history of Russia really as a very kind of brazen, unapologetic and proud colonial power has to be taken into account, I think, to make sense of what is going on there. Yeah. Anything short of that, anything that just focuses on Putin is going to leave you with a, a very truncated picture, right? And uh, finishing up, one amazing and unexpected and beautiful uh, effect of the horrible attack against Ukraine that, you know, Russia, is undertaken has been actually the acceleration of the decolonization processes in Central Asia, right? So uh, this is actually uh, my cousin and his wife, right? Mm -hmm. At the protest last spring. And uh, that was in Almaty, it was actually authorized by the authorities in um, Almaty. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen the news about the youths of invincibility uh, in um, Ukraine. And these things are beautiful because these are the kind of the, I think the emerging signs of post-colonial solidarity that uh, are growing in number. So to conclude, uh, in my opinion, to make sense of what's happening in modern Russia, you have to kind of see it for what it is. It is a successor to the Russian empire. The imperial worldview actually proved to have more staying power than the Soviet Union, right? So Soviet Union is no more, but that worldview is still there. And from Central Asia, it's super clear that what Russia is trying to, to do today is really kind of stop the flow of time, right? To reverse history, to go back to what it once was. And I think, again, in the long run, it's not going to succeed. It cannot succeed, right? The age of, age of empires is, is over, but they're trying to, they're trying to, to stop. But again, from the perspective of a former colony, I think until and unless there is a rejection of this imperial sort of idea 
in Russia, no one is safe. It doesn't really matter the last name of the person in the crowd. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashwamad. 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 Good afternoon, everyone. Congratulations on making it to the last presentation of the day. Hopefully everyone is sufficiently caffeinated and energized still. Uh, so today, like my co-panelists here, I'm going to focus on values in Russia. Uh, and I'm going to take a little different approach here, uh, asking the question of uh, to what extent are Russians likely to be receptive to this kind of values work of consolidating a particular set of uh, traditional moral and, and spiritual values. So Putin has been incorporating this kind of talk into his rhetoric uh, for, for a long time now. And a lot of these values center on ideas of uh, conservatism, patriotism, and anti-Westernism uh, in, in sort of various configurations. So we've long seen a, a values war of sorts going on that pits Western values against these traditional ones of Russia. Uh, and now we see that being translated into the, the physical war, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, uh, this discourse still coming up in, in different ways. So for example, in the, the recent State of the Nation address, uh, Putin commented on the degradation uh, of Western values, pointing out specific religions and their, their turn away from what he sees as the, the true scripture, uh, and saying that we, we must protect our, our children, uh, we will protect them from this degradation and uh, degeneration that we're, we're seeing elsewhere. Uh, so there, there has been this uh, discussion of values uh, to an extent as a way to sort of build up that, that moral support to position Putin as sort of both the father of the nation and the savior of these traditional values. All right, so I'm not going to go through the uh, sort of legislating values that's gone on for quite some time now. I think Ivan already went over that greatly. Uh, so I just want to sort of on this slide touch on that after this new executive order came out about values, uh, there has been put in place a cultural front of Russia that's bringing together different uh, actors in the cultural sphere to really promote and protect these particular values uh, and to organize their, their art around those. Uh, and this is being implemented at the regional level with regional branches of this cultural front being put in place. Uh, so I think it's important that we take a bit of a disaggregated approach to looking at uh, public values and public opinions in Russia uh, and see where there's potential for variation in support for this, this kind of thing. All right, so to see how fertile the ground is for this kind of consolidation of values work to, to link to consolidation of Putin's power, uh, I draw upon some survey and interview research that I did back in uh, 2015 to 2016. It's part of a broader project on looking at regional variation in Russian nation building. And I think a few of the, the question I, as I, questions I ask here can look at how uh, sort of conservative, patriotic, and anti-Western values uh, might be received by the population. Um, so here the data is drawn from three ethnic republics, Karelia, Tatarstan, and Buryatia, and three other neighboring non-ethnic regions, Murmansk, Samara, and Irkutsk. Uh, so I'll go through a few of these questions. The first one is, uh, I asked respondents, in which of the following spheres of public life does the government play an important role? Uh, and a few key things to, to take note of here. Uh, one is the surprising result that 91% of respondents said that preservation of history and memory uh, is one of those or spheres of uh, public life where government's playing a key role. Right? So with that sort of uniformity across region, across or political groups, um, you can see that there's this expectation that the government is going to be involved in some way uh, in this, this sort of memory and, and values type of work. Uh, so for all these questions, I also looked at is there significant regional variation? Uh, and there are on a, on a couple of these measures. So for instance, I want to point out that uh, in support for the music, art, and literature of Russia, um, there is sort of universally high numbers of people that, that raise this uh, issue, but uh, there is significant difference here. So the ethnic republics had higher levels of support uh, or higher numbers of respondents saying that they expect this is a, a key government role. Uh, potentially linking to you know, historical legacies of ethnic republics having the uh, sort of job of preserving culture in, in this space. Uh, and then also in terms of support for religious development, Tatarstan serves as an outlier here uh, with it was 70% of respondents named 
uh, named this as one of the, the key spheres. Right? So uh, about 10 points above the aggregate measure here. Right? Um, so while there, there seems to be a lot of support for government to be active in this work, um, it's not clear whether it's support for it to be of this sort of all Russia values and culture sort, um, or if there are more demands for instead of instead of all Russia, um, focus on also these regional values and identities. Okay. In terms of where uh, different levels of, of political ideology fall on this question, uh, there were significant differences among uh, all of these types of, of government influence with United Russia supporters uh, and those who said they, they don't know if they would vote or who they would vote for um, being higher than those who would vote for the opposition or for those who are saying they would not vote. Um, so this is what you might expect. Those who are or part of Putin's base are expecting the government to be involved in, in all of these spheres. Right, so the, the next question I think is useful to ask here, it's one that asks, uh, is asked on uh, sort of broader cross national surveys and world value survey a lot, uh, is which groups of people would you not want to be your neighbors? Okay. Uh, and, and here there is sort of indications that this, this conservative uh, turn and rhetoric and legislation does have a basis of support. Um, so respondents said that uh, homosexuals would, uh, they would not want that group as their neighbor at about the same rate as drug users and alcoholics. Um, but if we break this down by, by region, there are again, significant differences. Um, so Karelia, Irkutsk and Tatarstan, uh, they were more tolerant in their, their views than the other uh, regions of Russia. Uh, and at similar levels as to drug users and, and alcoholics as well. So they uh, were less likely to say they didn't want members of the LGBTQ community to, to be their neighbors. Um, so while there is that general high level of um, support for this particular conservative uh, turn, it's not going to play equally well in, in all of these regions. Uh, and again, on, on this question of people of another religion, uh, that is sort of where Tatarstan's tolerance uh, actually is, is a bit more limited than the other region with 40% of respondents saying they wouldn't want people of another religion to, to be their neighbor. Last important thing to note on this question is there are, there are no significant differences when it comes to people's vote choice uh, in these questions, except when it came to alcoholics, United Russia supporters were um, slightly less opposed to alcoholics being their neighbor. Uh, but the not sure how to read that data point. Uh, but the, the key thing there uh, is that uh, conservative legislation, especially when it comes to LGBTQ uh, rights and, and presentation, that uh, doesn't have their political party support differences. So it can play to United Russia supporters. It can also play to opposition supporters as well. And last question was asking respondents to say how much they agree or disagree with the statement that Russia is better than most other countries. So to try to get at that uh, sort of anti-Westernism, patriotic type of values. Uh, as you might expect, United Russia has the, the highest percentage saying they, they completely agree with this statement at about 68%. Uh, but then we also see the regional differences as well that are significant here. Um, so Karelia uh, and Samara come out on the, the low end of agreeing with the statement, uh, and Tatarstan and Yakutsk are at that, that higher end. Uh, so while uh, for these, these anti-Western and, and patriarch messages uh, will have some broad support, especially for Putin's base, uh, we are sort of likely to see these differences in, in reception. And lastly, I want to draw on a bit of my interview data to see what are alternative perceptions of values that are out there. Um, so I'm not claiming that these are uh, representative of the population. I can't say to what extent uh, people agree or disagree with these other perceptions, um, but just to, to give an idea of what are some alternatives in that marketplace of, of values and ideas. Uh, and these first two agree with Putin that we can separate values into, into different camps, um, but have different approaches to that. Uh, so the first respondent from Petra Zavolsk and Karelia, the one up near Finland, uh, argued that there, there are these distinctive European values, like support for the human rights and world development, um, but that that's a, a good thing. And it's a good thing that Karelia, uh, in, in this response view, is more accepting of those uh, than other regions within Russia. Uh, and and that, that is somewhat supported by that survey data in terms of how likely they are to uh, sort of embrace neighbors of, of different backgrounds. The other view that's still setting up divides uh, pushes back against Putin's idea that there are all Russia traditional 
values going on here, uh, and that instead we should be looking at values uh, disaggregated by different ethnicities. Uh, so this respondent in particular from Kazan um, thought that Turkic values uh, and cultural roots, roots are sort of distinctive and that they should be recognized as such. Um, interestingly, kind of supporting Putin's position here that Slavic <laughs> peoples can also be grouped together as, as having common roots and values, um, but challenging his idea that these can be all put within a, a greater Russian type of value. And the last different perspective on values here is, is one that we shouldn't necessarily be creating all these distinctions. Instead, we can think of it as like a, a Russian nesting doll uh, type of argument. Right? So uh, here, talking about Tatar literature in particular, uh, this respondent had the idea that, no, you can't have separate Tatar literature from Russian literature. Tatar literature is Russian literature, which is world literature. Uh, and across these, we can find these common human uh, literary plots and values. Um, so pushing back a little bit about that idea that we're um, sort of engaged in a values war. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, points here that show there is fertile ground for utilizing, consolidating, and talking about and legislating uh, traditional spiritual and moral values uh, to increase support for the Putin regime as a whole. Um, so there, there are support for different conservative uh, orientations that are pretty consistent uh, across the board and across different political orientations. Um, but we do see regional variation. So it's not a foolproof strategy. Uh, it's not one that is uh, sort of immune to opposition potential uh, when there is sort of pushback and demand for, uh, for instance, more uh, European outlook on, on values. Uh, and there's that, that similar inconsistency in belief about Russian superiority as well. Okay. Um, so when we're, we're looking at the, the sort of reception of these uh, sort of values and this discourse, uh, and beyond discourse, the actual uh, legislation and involvement in Russia's war in Ukraine, uh, it's important to sort of look beyond the aggregate numbers and see where there's potential for uh, pushback here, where there, there's potential for alternative views. Not to say that these alternative views will be activated, but that they have uh, the, the potential there to be drawn upon in, in the future. Um, so I'll end it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kathy. And I now would like to give the floor to our discussant, Eva Buza from the National Democratic Institute. Great, well, thank you. And thank you so much for asking me to join you. I am actually a very, very old Polnars member, no longer, but I was here at the beginning. So it's it's just so nice to be here and see all these new faces. Um, so it's it, for me, it's like, uh, I don't know, go, uh, a homecoming as it were. Um, I am gonna, um, you know, uh, the, the presentations and the papers, all of them, um, what holds them together is they're looking at the relationship between values, ideology, and culture, and political behavior, and the way in which political leaders try to influence, manipulate publics through invoking, line, um, through invoking values. And what I find interesting is this line of study is something that seems to be researching right now. And I, I suspect, although I'd be interested in people's views, is that a lot has to do with the virtue disinformation campaigns that we're seeing, um, not just in Russia, but around the world. So I think this interest in values and, and man, political manipulation is somehow associated with that. Um, I am gonna um, pick on um, as a Matt and Katie, because I had the most time to reflect on what you um, what you had written, what you thought, but I do have some questions for the um, the other presenters. But I apologize that I haven't. Maybe I won't do it justice because I just haven't had enough time to process what you said. Um, so with as a Matt and Katie's papers, um, they're really interrogating the relationship between Putin's rhetoric his appeal to what he identifies as traditional Russian values and the Russian population support for him and the war in Ukraine. And Azamat argues that the reason why Putin's anti-Ukrainian propaganda works is because it taps into key Russian beliefs and identity. Um, 
And, you know, accordingly, and he and as he presented to us, the Russian public agrees with Putin's portrayal of Russia as a benevolent empire, and that they believe um, the sovereignty of its colonial subjects is, as Putin has said, a geopolitical catastrophe that needs fixing. Um, and he concludes that until the stream of empire ends, um, and Russia is comprehensively defeated in Ukraine, its neighbors will not be safe. You know, this question of whether the war is Russia's war or Putin's war is critical. And yet it's really difficult to unpack. Um, you know, and this reliance on polls, and you talked about the different views on the polls, is um, particularly polls conducted in authoritarian states or in closed or closing states, is very, very tricky. And um, in my own, um, a lot of my previous experience, I've worked a lot on, on polling. Um, you know, and I, I just, um, I just have a difficulty when you're thinking about, you know, the Levada polls, they're going into people's houses and asking them sensitive questions, which, you know, as you yourself said, people realize that the answers to those questions or even engaging in this could get them imprisoned. So it's just really, really hard to think about how do, how do we weigh this kind of a poll? Um, I actually think it's remarkable that 20% of the respondents said that they don't support the actions of the Russian military forces in Ukraine. And here I'm, here I'm making the assumption that the can't say means don't, I won't say. But, you know, again, we could discuss this. That doesn't mean, though, and I agree with you, that there isn't a role for polls in um, closed and closing societies. But I think the key has to be in how the questions are posed. So, you know, when I was thinking about supporting your thesis, I think I would have a lot more faith in questions that would not be so clearly critical of the current regime. So, for example, you know, I'd love to see some questions, and I know it doesn't, I don't think it exists, but, you know, questions about Russia's <laughs> contributions to former parts of the Soviet empire, or, you know, asking questions to people, um, you know, ask, asking respondents, um, do they see neighboring states of having their own identity? Um, so questions that would indirectly get at this um, relationship or view of empire and its importance. Um, I found the overlay that you showed us that your colleague did um, of approval ratings with Russia's wars really interesting. Um, I'd be interested in adding yet another layer, which would be um, looking at announcements of measures taken to close the political space. So, you know, increased human vi right, violate, uh, rights violations or introductions of restricted legal measures. So there certainly have been certain periods when those have come in. It'd be really interesting to see how that, how that superimposed and whether that gives you any insight into the impact of repression on what people are willing to say or not say. Um, I also very much appreciated your observations from the Central Asian perspective. Um, and this is the part of the paper I really would encourage you to expand. Um, because you describe how Russians view Central Asia, I want to see much more analysis and discussion of how Central Asians see Russia and how that affects their attitudes to the Ukrainian war. And I think, you know, as you intimated, and I think we've seen, um, uh, you know, get hints of this in the reluctance of Central Asian governments to vote against the recent UNGA uh, resolution calling for Russians to end hostilities and withdraw forces. So to return though to your main thesis, I guess I'm not, I didn't come away convinced that the majority of Russians support Putin's war because they bought into the view that Russia can and should reacquire its empire. I think where I land is a little bit more what we heard about earlier today, which is the view that society is divided um, and that there are those who are violently against Putin and the war. A lot of them have left the country or they've been imprisoned. Then. Um, there are those who strongly support Putin and the war for various reasons, including the empire discussion. And then there's that middle, um, people have called it the swamp, who are more concerned about their own and their family's welfare, and who just want to be left alone to live their lives. 
And it's this middle group that, you know, I think was discussed. They're avoiding political engagement. They're trying to close their eyes and they're hoping that normal life will return. And when necessary, they say what they believe they're supposed to say. Um, moving um, to Katie's paper, Katie Simley um, used polling commission from Levada to help her develop a picture of the values held by Russians in different parts of the country. And she's interested in understanding whether Putin's attempts at promoting a set of conservative values, which are anti-Western and homophobic, will have resonance with populations across the country and encourage them to support Putin and the war in Ukraine. And she concludes that support is likely to be uneven due to different regional attitudes to the role of government in religion and culture and to different groups of people like drug users, alcoholics, homosexuals, and Im immigrants. I, I think the work you're doing is really important to look at these regional differences. Um, but I think in the next iteration of this paper, there's a couple of things I would um, encourage you to do, and you're probably already doing it. Um, you know, in, in the slides and in the paper, you mentioned the differences that may be driven by political affiliation. Um, I think the next step to, is to provide those tables and also to discuss the relationship between political affiliation and geolocation. Um, in ethnic republics versus neighboring republics. I think it'd be really interesting to look at that. Um, I, I think that your evidence points to the fact that on several dimensions, you don't see a clear distinction in values and attitudes between ethnic versus neighboring regions, right? Um, so to me, it's like, why? Like, what's driving this? What, are, what is, and um, is it age? Is it gender? How do these affect attitudes? And, I refer to Henry, who had a paper sometime, a Poner's memo I found, um, where you were looking at um, the legit Rus survey, and you explored the questions of who supported Putin's conservative or traditional values. And I think you found that age was a very important variable in, in all of this. Um, so I think looking at some of those variables, it would be really interesting now to get to, uh, to take this to the next level. Um, I did, uh, I wanted to end though with um, some questions uh, to the other panelists. Um, and first of all, Antonia, I loved all our slides and this is exactly what we needed at this time of the, of the day. Um, and, you know, I, I started, you know, you beautifully characterize this cult of personality. And I, I go back to my, we won't say how old I am, but um, I remember um, taking courses um, from um, Professor Dahlin. And one of the things we had to do, you know, this question of um, the old political science question of what is, what is the role of culture and politics? And are certain populations more, sent, more prone to cults of personality versus not. So that's my question. My, my simple question to you is, is there something about the Russian culture that makes it more prone to um, cults of personality? Um, to Ivan, um, you know, I think it's so interesting what you're saying about how, um, how does Putin adapt his ideology to goals? Um, and as you say, it's very challenging to, to to watch that and, and disaggregate that. I guess my question though is, you know, it's, it's easy, um, if you look at political messaging, most political um, uh, uh, po politicians in more open societies, they use polls, they use focus groups, um, and that helps them shape their messages. So my question to you is, what do you think are those inputs that are being used to adapt the idea? Theology, who's doing it, and what is the basis? Um, and then finally, to Ivan Grek, you know, I think it's how does ideology work is at the core of I think what you're talking about. And um, you you sort of you, you you posit that Putin's ideology is successful because it co-ops existing civil society values. Um, and then you talk about the mechanism. You know, you talked quite a bit about the mechanisms. Um, through which the ideas of this intelligentsia as represented by the writers' union permeated um, and, and resonated with the political elites. 
The next question though is, all right, we get to that level. How does it then get embedded into society? What are those mechanisms? Um, so I wanna leave it there, but I wanna end with two policy questions. Um, because that's what I do now, and, and I would love to get, hear your thoughts. Um, the first is, do you think that a population's values are immutable, unchangeable? If not, who can change them and what can change them? And that leads to the, real, the more hardcore policy question, which is, what does that mean for strategies and policies that countries, specifically the US, the UK, and Europe, should adopt in their relations to Russia. I'll end there. Thank you so much, Eva, for all these great comments and questions. I propose as we have half an hour, I propose to collect questions from the room and when I will give you back the floor, you can also add some uh, 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 comments or answer to Eva's question. So let's open the floor for question and then we will have the mic going to you. I see one first question there in the back. Hi, I'm Stanislav Budnitsky from the Canon Institute at Wilson. The question is to Ivan Grek. Uh, why are you tracing the uh, colonial discourse and rhetoric or post-colonial discourse and rhetoric to the right-wing tradition as opposed to the left-wing socialist side tradition of um, you know, internationalism and uh, why do you think they're tapping into that as opposed to um, this yeah, established tradition that's, that a lot of the population can still remember even through their living memory um, and relate to? Let's collect three questions and then I give you the floor. So I saw a second question there and then there would be a third one in the back. <laughs> hey, my name is Saidan and I'm a Fulbright scholar from Kazakhstan. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, the Chinese peace plan. Uh, so, okay, well, of course, uh, bringing the justice to the war criminals and the reparations are important, but that will take time. Uh, but on the other hand, it's more urgent to stop the war, to stop the casualties of the war. And uh, from that sense, um, like in that plan, it's, it's not like bullet points, it's sequential, so the first point is the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine, meaning that uh, Crimea should belong to Ukraine. Of course, Putin will never, uh, he will never accept that. So wouldn't um, like for the West to double down on this particular point will be like very uh, important thing that uh, will uh, bring the crack to this uh, regime or uh, at least bring the necessary pressure uh, okay, maybe not for the regime collapse, but the departure of Putin, uh, because like it's very important. It, it will be like a, it will bring like a global pressure on uh, on on this whole situation. So, what do you think about that? Thank you. And a third question there in the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Alexander Maskalenko. I'm Ivan's uh, for me, uh, colleague from uh, Central of European Policy Analysis. Um, for me, all the presentations, or most of them, sounded as a success of Mr. Putin to manipulate, to use different manipulative strategies uh, to get some uh, points, some success. Uh, my question, to, I think, to all of you, uh, so what is wrong uh, with the Russian uh, society, Russian people, that uh, any, any type of Putin can so much easily sell you uh, this uh, wicked ideology to get some political benefits and to to use it uh, against uh, against the Russian people, or maybe uh, Putin says something that Russian people are happy to hear. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I propose to make a first round of discussion for these three questions and Eva's comment, and then that will give us time for a second round of question. Who would like to begin? Ivan, Greg, yeah. would you like to <laughs> launch the discussion? Yeah. As you had one question precisely to you. Yeah, sure. So, uh, starting from you know, let's take the mic closer to you. One of the mic. One one. Can you hear me now? Yeah. No. no. Okay. I'll just uh, lower. Uh, yeah. Pressure. One one. one. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. So, uh, how they kind of return the the value? So, the the one of the big points is that uh, they pick the actual picked uh, values and ideas and discursive practices that have been popular before. 
So uh, the writers' union, so they were the phenomenon. Uh, so each Soviet person at one point uh, read some of that, right? Whether it will be Solzhenitsyn or Praskurian or whoever. So they picked something already understandable out there on the ground, uh, absorbed it, and returned it in a kind of a, uh, in a way that people can respond to those ideas in political actions. So probably the most uh, prominent, popular one, uh, if you remember those lines to St. Relics in Moscow. Right, 15 million people visited uh, that tour arranged by the Centenarius Foundation, headed by Yukunin. But the idea belonged to those guys in 1992. They were the first to bring those relics in 1995, as far as I remember, 96, right? So they took the, that practice that was popular, they took that discourse that was already popular, and uh, then re kind of uh, acquired it, basically, right? And started to return back in the form of uh, uh, political actions, and uh, they engaged and incorporated a lot of other smaller. Uh, illiberal initiatives on the ground. So and they, that's how they maintain this back and forth uh, with the society. And finally, uh, we have Putin publishing uh, his uh, articles on the historical relations with Ukraine that simply repeats that. Right, so it was kind of a really active uh, cooperation and uh, Yukunin played a really important role in this. And this is uh, not a uh, an accident that Putin participated in the life of St. Andrew's Foundation once they acquired it from the civil society and made it a gongo, right? Uh, the government organization de facto. Uh, First five years, Putin was was there at all major events. He pronounced, he used their language, he shared his thoughts uh, at their platform. So it was kind of really vibrant until they uh, just stole uh, the entire discourse, and there was kind of no reason to follow up with this. Um, so uh, as for the question, why it is uh, the right post-colonialism, not the left post-colonialism? So basically, we can see this uh, from the larger context. Uh, what is the uh, influence of the West? Cultural occupation of Ukraine. Right, they are the food Russians. We're coming back to this uh, pan Slavist narrative as well, right? So this is a form of a cultural occupation that has been continued for a really, really long time. So fascism is a form of a Western cultural occupation as well, right? That's a Western idea, as as it's pronounced in the discourse. Uh, and uh, he does not really operate with uh, with the terms that are usually uh, leftist. So, for instance, we liberated for what cause? to be free from the uh, metropole now, right? The cause is different. So we do this to bring the justice, and the justice is remove the West, that's it, right? So basically, and we can come to our uh, centralized living as we want. So basically, uh, uh, this kind of, I mean, with the examples and text, it will be just easier to demonstrate, but the whole idea is that it really fits the uh, larger context. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that's why for me, it sounds kind of a, a bit awkward when you have this right wing agenda, and then, and, and which then uh, shifts to the left. Much. Yes. So, Thank you very much. Uh, did you know this, that those pictures were entertaining at the end of the day? And you named them the cultural influence, right? I think that Putin would be flattered because he and his clique understand very well that actually it's not the cultural influence. It's a, manip it's a usage of the culture as a manipulative uh, tool. And uh, but if we leave it aside uh, and go to the essence of the question, um, if the uh, Russian culture is responsible, and to what extent? Uh, the answer would be yes, because if we would uh, recall the line of Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, Smiris Kavkaz, Idiot Yermolov, you know, and in English it would be, I just found it. Humble yourself, Caucasus, your Molov is coming, then you will feel the sense of the spirit of Russia, which could not be found anywhere else, you know, like more precise than in Pushkin's uh, creative writings. And if you look more deeper in those texts, you can find it everywhere in Tolstoy's writings, in Dostoevsky's, of course. Uh, so, like, if Russian people are responsible for that, I don't know, but uh, this uh, Kavkazki Plenik poem, it was studied in school, in schools for like forever, in all schools. So I think that it sits deep there in the consciousness and it has to be removed if we want to remove the empire from our neighborhood. Thank you. Ivan. Uh, okay, uh, first I will reply to Ivar's question about the inputs and polls. Um, well, uh, 
from what we know about the Kremlin is that they're really fond of all kinds of polls and really try to accommodate uh, to what they know about the society and they have their own polls. So certainly uh, these are taken into account uh, when uh, these uh, texts are produced. But uh, what is even more noticeable is that in those texts, you can really see uh, elements that are produced by different parts of the elite. So uh, you can really see that this part is kind of used because uh, looks like uh, Iriyanko-esque, and this part is from Patrushev. So uh, many of these texts are kind of these uh, uh, products of this collective um, collective effort of the elite. And um, uh, I think uh, those different ideas of how the world works and, how, and where uh, Russia should move towards uh, actually are even more important inputs, even in comparison to what they, they see involved. Um, uh, yeah, next question. Uh, I will try to uh, answer to Alexander. Well, in a way, uh, there's nothing wrong with the Russians because uh, most of the population of the Earth live under the autocracy. So in a way, they are very typical. Um, uh, if uh, if, to, if I try to reformulate this question, why, why Putin succeeds? Um, well, I think his, his main uh, success is that he was able to manufacture this uh, majority. Uh, so basically, he took a country that is a uh, public sphere that is split into, into smaller groups, and then he was able to, to manipulate the public sphere into creating this majority to which uh, this swamp wants to join. And this, is, this is basically the strategy. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, one of the one of the minorities is that that one that wants to hear what Putin says, and the rest are just joining or don't want to be in trouble uh, opposing it publicly. Kathy, do you want to comment? Um, to give it to your question, I um, I've been thinking a lot about the issue of polls and to what extent. Uh, opinion polls in authoritarian regimes can be trusted, but um, I do feel like, you know, the polling or, you know, a lot of polling has been around for a long time, right? And it's been around since before some of the more draconian laws were adopted. And it just seems that the, the, the narrative about, oh, we cannot trust polls, we should just throw out the results that you see so much, you know, coming from a lot of folks who are sort of very prominent members of the Russian opposition, it just seems very convenient, right? So that, yeah, now that we're getting the results that look terrible, like they show something terrible about Russian society, all of a sudden, uh, well, the, it's the credibility of the pollsters now, that's the question. So to me, I, 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 I'm I afraid of sort of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I think that, the, the you know, if you if you read what Nevada has to say about the methodology, it it's, looks very serious and rather convincing, right? I, I, I suppose, yeah. That's my point. And yeah, and um, as far as why, or you, you said policy inputs, what as so the US, what can US government do, right? Or Europe, or? Or Europe, I mean, honestly, it just seems that if the issue is that how do you do away with this sort of imperial worldview, with this posture, I think really what needs to happen is defeat on the battlefield. Right. And so maybe the most effective thing that can be done is providing more powerful weapons to Ukraine. Thank you, thank you very much for your, your comments. Uh, I was trying to figure out how to or fit all these different questions into an, an eight-minute presentation and a brief policy memo. Um, but I think you're right that it might be uh, more useful to maybe do a separate model for each region uh, and include all these variables in there like ethnicity, age, gender, um, political party choice uh, that might be able to tease out some of these dynamics a little bit more. So I'll certainly work on, on that component. Uh, and then, then I think I'll combine the question of uh, how are Russians manipulated and are values changeable together? Because I think they get a, a sort of a similar thing. Uh, and I would say that, that values do tend to be pretty sticky. They're not something that's fast moving uh, in the aggregate over time. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say that that Russians are necessarily just being manipulated. Right? So this is a uh, more of a iterative process over time that, that Putin is not making up these values out of nowhere. So there, there is already some support in society there. Uh, it's more of reinforcing 
some of those, those existing values, uh, while also setting those discursive boundaries on the population as well. Um, so those who may not agree um, still know what the, the script is regarding what values they should be talking about and how. Uh, so there's sort of less space to advocate for those alternative type of values in society. Um, so in terms of, of policy recommendations, I, I would say the U.S., it, it can't serve that sort of beacon on the hill position anymore, uh, sort of being that shining light where by our democratic qualities, we can sort of lead others in that way. Um, but instead, that values change really has to come from inside, um, from, from the people itself. Uh, and, and my research, research shows so that there are sort of alternative values there already. Um, so it's a matter of when can that political opening come and how that can come about uh, to, to give that voice. Unfortunately, now it's becoming increasingly closed, uh, especially um, in terms of the education sphere as well. Uh, only these values are being promoted in the cultural sphere that's closing as well with the new cultural front uh, and the, the sort of policing of values in that sphere. Uh, so it's it'll be very difficult to, to change that dominant value uh, position. Excellent. So we have questions in the online chat, but I would like to merge them with questions from the room. So I see a question here, two questions there, and then we will take these two and the one in the online chat. <laughs> Thank you, Michael Keyes from the Kennan Institute of the Wilson Center. Excellent panel. Uh, my, I, I love the whole discussion about sort of uh, tapping into nostalgia, whether it's imperial or Soviet, and uh, pulling along the society that way, you know, sort of tapping into people's good feelings, I guess, uh, if you want to call it that, to, to get everybody behind um, what's going on in Ukraine. I guess I'd like, I haven't heard so much on the other end, uh, the use of fear. Uh, and so I, I want to put this question out for anybody who's brave enough or willing to answer it, which is, can we expect any kind of meaningful uh, change in socio-political attitudes in Russia without the security state collapsing in a major way? And the follow-on to that would be, if Russia lost the war in Ukraine, however you want to define that, does that mean that the, that the security state has collapsed in Russia? Thank you. Thank you. I see a question from Alexandra in green. The mic is coming to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this insightful panel. We talked a lot about more like how did we get here? So I would like to ask you to think uh, how do we get out of here? And basically to think about the future and it's, it's kind of relates to what Katie said that you said that there are already some kind of um, um, alternative values developing. My question is more uh, actionable. Are there organizations or movements that have an actionable step-by-step -step plan? How does Russia change after Ukrainian victory and Russian military defeat, which will come sooner or later? And if there are such organizations, what kind of, uh, what is the social profile of these people? Are these academics? Are these uh, civil society actors, human, uh, human rights organizations, or maybe some other really groups we, we don't know? Thank you. Thank you. And then we had several questions in the chat, but let me kind of summarize them. And they are both on, in fact, the, the tensions uh, uh, that we have on the panel on, are we looking at the kind of input, right? How the, the Kremlin's kitchen is working and the co-creational aspect of the interaction with the society. So we have one question, Ivan, for me, partly answer that about how do we know who is writing what, right? Who are the speech writer? How that mechanism, the bureaucracy of writing speeches and ideology is, is, uh, is functioning with a, a part of the question, including what are the role of Russian scholars in participating in creating the ideology? And then the, co the co-creational aspect, maybe for uh, um, uh, Cathy on, the role of popular culture in being reshaped by the conservative values of the patriotism, patriotic values in helping spreading a message that is not interpreted as political, but as being the kind of, you know, everyday cultural consumption. So really big 
key question, I think, and on that, after that, we probably won't have time <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, to continue. So maybe let's begin with the, the two questions we have and this kind of from input to co-creational aspect. Who would like Okay, well, maybe, um, I already said a couple of words about co-creation co by the bureaucracy. So um, just to go, I'll pick up a more how we can know actually if you read the smaller people in the elite and then compare them to, to Putin's speeches, you can easily notice uh, those traces there. Uh, to answer the question about uh, what what happens um, if, if Russia is defeated, um, I think the, the whole problem with the narrative about uh, uh, the war being Russia's war is that we tend to, if we assume this, which we, we will overestimate the effect of the defeat on the domestic Russian dynamics. Um, I think uh, we should, uh, I, 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 I don't think that Russian society is that invested into this war to actually uh, for, for defeat to produce any domestic change. At least uh, I'm, not, I'm not that sure. So I think uh, Putin can easily stay in office and die in office, even even if he was a Spaniard or in the next or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I can I can up on this. That's um, uh, basically the war has became a product already, right? That's a kind of a. Uh, oh, sorry, from the, from another point, there were two recent surveys and uh, uh, one interview. So interview by Levinson, the head of Nevada, who called Russia the society of excitement, because. Uh, there is no vision of future. So the, the best vision of future that can be produced in Russia now that Russia will win because there is no other way to be. That's it. That's kind of a not really a positive statement, right? Uh, in a sense, but this is kind of what, what inspired because there is just nothing else around, right? And uh, from his perspective, there is this uh, specific core of uh, really uh, of like hawks and warmongers that uh, produces this excitement. They are on TV and people like, hey, you know, I'm either following this or kind of I'm just appearing to be in the society that just drops down, right? That's that's the collapse. And then they make the choice, like, hey, that, that's fun, right? So we can just win because we should win, right? That's it. So, uh, and that's 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 the message that is getting, uh, uh, producing this excitement. And if you will uh, check the recent polls, 35% uh, uh, of Russian population now see the hope in future. That's the highest since, Ever. <laughs> so the poll was since uh, 2012. So maybe there was kind of excitement before that. But in the last 10 years, uh, people just feel that they are kind of a part of something, right? So uh, they are within this big event. So this excitement is there. That's that's what we can see uh, from the polls as well. Um, uh, so on the, on the security part uh, and the worst product, uh, I do not think that the war in Russia will stop with, uh, with the borders of 1991, because Russia can retreat up to Vladivostok. And the defeat, I mean, de facto defeat means that the entire defeat of Russian military, right? And that's kind of quite a capacity still. So, uh, and that's why probably the change uh, won't, be mil it's a, won't be a military change. That shall be a change of politics and society in Russia. And another poll by Nkimo now shows that uh, uh, Russians are generally see, uh, so this is the poll that was conducted for uh, two years uh, all across the country, that Russians see them in their future as uh, a part of a kind of a, Free, they see personal freedom, right? So basically what they experienced uh, in the previous uh, 30 years, they see this point when to way to evolve and develop and leave. So uh, basically the war message to live in the war circumstances is not the, what they desire, right? But uh, at the same time, they understand that they might sacrifice this for the same sense of security. And they cannot explain what is it. But for now, they consider uh, Ukraine as an attacking side. And that's more and more present. So if you see the uh, interviews with PRWs that we analyze, they see, but you attacked us, right? So it, it goes there. So until is this security measure kind of a uh, reason, security reasoning is there, uh, Russians will be in this kind of a uh, war supporting, uh, actively supporting or just passively supporting uh, majority in a sense. And as for the organizations that are there, there are a lot of organizations and they attempted to make three military coups in Russia already, including uh, organizations by Stelkov, Bajkov, Prigozhin, and so on. Yeah, so, I mean, but that, 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 that's the point that uh, they are, uh, so now they can view themselves with veterans. So basically the change from, from below will be definitely liberal from, from my perspective, right? Uh, because before that, I mean, Bajkov spent 15 years in prison for a military coup attempt against Putin. Now he has the veterans coming and listening to him. So, and uh, there's a lot of, they're just uh, extending their kind of uh, 
core group of uh, probably probable changers of the future. So nothing happy to follow. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, there's certainly a, a co-creation of or both power and values in the cultural sphere going on. Uh, to, to speak to the security state as well, these values have been securitized. So they're, as Ivan said, they're in the national security strategy of uh, 2021. Uh, so there, it's not just imposed by police forces or uh, the, the military, um, but instead you have uh, people engaged in, in cultural work, uh, sort of reinforcing these, these sort of values over time. Uh, it's important to note that there is space there for, for pushback and some cultural figures are doing that, uh, but by and large, that space is becoming increasingly regulated and, and enforced by those in that cultural sphere as well. Uh, and this, this isn't, some of the legislation's new, but this practice isn't new as well. I think it was in uh, 2016 in Petrozvodsk in Karelia. I went to a, a rock concert, and I forget the band's name right now. I'm blanking on it. Uh, but uh, at one point, everyone in the crowd sort of kneeled as they were recognizing the fighters in Donbass. Uh, so there is this sort of integration as of cultural spaces like concerts uh, or or museums, especially now, as being uh, important both transmitters of these sort of values, but also uh, spaces in which people are coming together and seeing how everyone else is is reacting. So you see everyone kneel um, as the the band says, "Let's let's do this," uh, and, and that sort of sends a signal of what everyone around you um, sort of potentially thinks, or at least what they're they're acting as if they do. Yeah, I don't know what you want. Just a quick comment, you know, in response, what I think was asked whether or not we can expect change from within society, Russian society, you know, without, uh, you know, just emerging organically. And, and, and honestly, could we expect a change in German society without the defeat in World War II? Right? I don't think that's going to just somehow happen. It really boils down to, I think, what happens. Yeah, I, I'd like to say a couple more words about the co-creation, although I don't think that co-creation is applicable for the activity from the, from the side of Russian power towards uh, Russian culture. But what, where we can see that merging of the cultural forms and the exercising and the uh, power it is like the usage of all types of uh, cultural forms, such as hip hop, rock and roll, uh, pop music, uh, and the folklore type music. That is where the messages of the current uh, power is being uh, are being in, in embedded. You know, like uh, if you Google and uh, listen to the uh, song of Vladimir Putin Maladets where like 80 percent of the content uh, is uh, the uh, same line vladimir putin maladies like and it's going on and on and on and in the rest like 20 percent you will uh, hear the uh, lines of admiration of the guy so uh, and it, it, it is uh, being uh, reproduced and uh, there are remakes in hip-hop style in rock and roll style, in the academic singing style, everywhere with video clips and without it. So there is no chance for the Russian uh, average citizens, citizen now, to escape those messages. And if we, we do understand that uh, to create the uh, power, it means to place certain type, a certain place, uh, a, a certain type of the cultural form at certain place at certain time, and that's what's going on in Russia. But it's not, of course, the co-creation. It's like the pure uh, naked usage of uh, the culture. I would say. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, it's already time for us to conclude this really yeah. wonderful, if depressing <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a panel, wonderful research on depressing topics. Uh, uh, before we applaud our last uh, last panel speaker, I also wanted to ask you to uh, uh, thank and applaud our Irish staff who has been organizing everything and dealing with all our. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
those of you who were online, thank you for all our speakers to come, for you to be in the room and for the IWI staff for organizing everything. And we hope to see you soon for other events. Thank you.